All right, you're up. Okay, great. Oh. Uh, I'd like to call this uh, meeting to order. It's a workshop meeting, public hearing being held at the uh, Architecture Review and Planning Board in town of Gulfstream, Florida on Thursday, March 16th, 8.30 in the William F. Cope Jr. Commission Chambers at the Town Hall, 100 C Road, Gulfstream, Florida. Roll call, please. Mr. Roach. Here. Mr. Green. Here. Mrs. Smith. Here. Mr. Campfield. Here. Mrs. Power. Here. And Vice Chairman Doherty. Here. Let it also be noted that uh, Chairman Murphy is absent with notice and also present is Assistant Town Attorney Trey Nazaro, myself, and Mayor Morgan. All right, very good. So uh, the purpose of this meeting is to review the town code, the town code and requirements for public officials. <clears throat> Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Vice Chairman Doherty, ARPB, Trey Nazaro, uh, Assistant Town Attorney here just with a brief presentation covering uh, your sort of your responsibilities and in, in the Florida law as it relates to uh, being on a, a public board and then also delving into the code kind of from soup to nuts, just giving a review of some of you have been on there um, probably longer than I've been licensed to practice law. I don't know how <laughs> we've got a few of our ARPB members who have been on a while. Uh, and then, of course, some of our newer uh, alternate members. So the, the title is just trying to just be funny. So you're on the ARPB, and that may be something that you hear uh, when someone gets a notice for an application that they, they may or may not like, and they'll you know want to start to talk to you, and that's covered here in uh, ex parte communication. So there are four sort of major topics that I, I wanted to cover as it relates to your responsibilities. First is the Sunshine Law. The two of you can't talk outside of a public meeting about an item that could foreseeably come before you. So certainly if you get a, a development application or a, you know your, your packet, you can't discuss that with another board member outside of, of where we are right now, uh, which, is, uh, which is a notice meeting that's open to the public and that Renee is gonna take minutes for. Uh, the second is public records. We don't have, um, our officials don't really generate tons of public records. It's really mostly staff. We'll communicate with you. So those are uh, certainly public records that we generate. Uh, but typically it's it's gonna be a phone call that staff makes to us. Uh, we've had a lot of public records requests in the past for uh, materials from our, our board members. And you guys just don't generate a lot. It's really just the materials that we send to you and then conversations with staff. But it is a big deal and a, your responsibility, so I just wanted to just mention that a little bit. Uh, ex parte communications. Uh, at one point, uh, ex parte communications were presumed to be prejudicial. They were a bad thing. It's essentially communication between counsel and the court when opposing counsel is not present. Of course, this is quasi-judicial, so it's not the court, but it is essentially an applicant who would stand here. They talk to you about the presentation, and you might have had a conversation outside of this publicly open notice meeting that is in your mind of, oh, well, John Doe really didn't like this because of these certain items. Well, you would just need to disclose that communication uh, as part of the process because this is a quasi-judicial hearing where you're acting like judges in a courtroom, applying the facts of an application, what I have and what I'm presenting, my house, what it looks like, the size, the FAR, the setbacks, everything from soup to nuts to the law, which is the town code, right? So it's it's not whether you like it or not, it's whether or not it meets that criteria. And because of that, it's it's uh, called uh, quasi-judicial. Uh, so again, just delving a little bit deeper into that. So the Sunshine Law applies to any gathering of two or more members of the same board to, this, to discuss some matter which will foreseeably come before the board for action. So it's about whether it's, it's it will foreseeably come before you. So. It, it, that's pretty clear what your sort of jurisdiction is, right? You're the ARPB, you handle applications for development approval. So if you're talking about a home that is in the process or something that's sold, maybe what, you know, talk about 3,400. That was a, an empty lot for, for a long time. Um, what could possibly be there or what you would want to be there, you know, that that's fine. But once you get into specifics, about an application or maybe something that you've heard about, you just, there, there's that gray area. So you wouldn't really wanna talk between each other about that, certainly talk to the community and, and everyone feel free, but that would be something that, okay, 
we're talking about maybe something that is less nebulous and would foreseeably come before us. That's something that the two of you can talk, uh, talk together about. Um, and it, it is members of the same board. So realistically, or you know, just because of that, uh, the commission is a separate board. You're not voting on the same thing at the same time. The mayor is sitting here, um, you know, if he had a conversation with you about an application, that is an, an ex parte communication, but it's not prohibited by the Sunshine Law because all the deliberation, all the thought process is out in the open. The fact that you, the two of you had a discussion is irrelevant because he's not voting with you at the ARPB level, right? So just to make that clear, it's everyone on the same board, um, but that would be uh, an, an ex parte communication that you need to disclose. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, again, public records, the Florida Constitution grants every person the right to inspect or copy any public record made or received in the connection with official business of the public body. So typically it's going to be emails, email correspondence. Uh, if you're corresponding with the town, we're going to have a copy of that. So that's not uh, that big a deal because we're, we can be the custodian of that. But different records have different retention schedules. <laughs> Uh, based on the subject matter, whether it's you know relating to a development application that's pending, uh, there's going to be some uh, some retention rules. So just if you have any questions, just ask Renee. But I just did want you to be aware of, of that, and, and certainly if you have any questions, you can certainly reach out to, to myself or Renee. And then there's the government, the Sunshine Manual. That is a downloadable PDF from the Florida Attorney General's website. Uh, we can uh, uh, certainly email you a copy, but it's just it's just an easy reference for uh, really for me, and it covers everything that relates to the Sunshine Law, different boards, all the case law that's come out over the years for uh, open meetings, and then also public records. Uh, but it's there if you have any interest in delving into that uh, that further. Uh, so again, ex parte communication. So moving on to that, it's about an application outside of a public hearing. So obviously, we're here. If we had a presenter, Mark Marsh might be on his way. I don't know if he's late again today. <laughs> or today you might want to reach out. Maybe he's having car trouble. <clears throat> but we can talk about that application in this meeting like we did, even though the applicant wasn't here, because it's noticed. It's on the agenda. We have someone in attendance that wants to talk about it. We're considering it. Uh, some some municipalities, you know, the, the staff does uh, a presentation as well. Um, you know, so that was uh, absolutely proper. But if we stopped the meeting and we were in the parking lot and you guys started talking about it, we, we did defer it. So that is again, uh, I'm sorry, now I'm going in, I'm back into Sunshine Law. Um, so let me let me just come back. A resident knows you're on the ARP and starts talking to you about a notice she received from the home next door. That is an ex parte communication. That is absolutely fine but it needs to be disclosed. So when the chairman, whether it's uh, Malcolm or Mr. Doherty, calls for disclosure of ex parte communications, pursuant to our ordinance, you are to disclose the subject of the communication and the identity of the person that you spoke to. Uh, and that was, uh, originally that was prohibited until uh, around 1995 when the Florida legislature decided in, in uh, response to some case law, well, that case law wasn't really that good. We need to allow more flexibility in communicating with our elected officials on, on items that maybe the, the, the individual can't make it to the meeting. So I wanna talk to Georgette and I wanna tell her about this thing, but I can't make the meeting. Well, that's, that's acceptable. You know, Georgette would just say, okay, we can have that conversation, but I do need to disclose what we spoke about and, and who you are during the meeting, just so they know that. Um, they can also send in correspondence to Renee. A lot of the times they feel that's easier, uh, but that just kind of gets around <clears throat> the ability, you know, people's inability to attend, but but um, but do want their opinions heard. Uh, and then of course, the purpose of the statute is to require public officials to disclose in order to assure the adverse party has an ability to look into that conversation and address those those concerns, right? So again, it's not something that's just inside your brain and you know not part of the 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 record really uh but maybe swaying you 
So that's made part of the record. Everyone understands what's going on. And me, the applicant, would be able to say, okay, well, that may be true, but look at this other aspect of the project that really addresses that concern. So then we can kind of get that all in the open and, uh, and then have some sort of resolution out in the public. Uh, quasi judicial proceedings. So, a question, right? Just yes, question. please. But all con we can have any conversations with staff we want, and that doesn't have to be. That, that's that's correct. Yes. Yeah. So staff staff is is typically not an, an advocate. It's really just just factual matters. So we're not trying to sway you one way or the other. You know, uh, Greg does have to. Uh, his responsibility is to provide a recommendation. And he'll tell you what that recommendation is based on, which is also typically included in, in the staff report, right? Okay. Um, yeah, because I one of the questions I've always kind of I'm always asking Greg about is like precedent, right? Being new, it's trying to figure out, but but all of those questions are are okay. Sure. And uh, no, absolutely. And we encourage you guys to reach out to staff if you have any questions about an application, certain sections of the code um you know there are different criteria that you know special exceptions which i'm going to mention later there are when you apply for a special exception there are certain criteria that you need to meet so maybe talking about that and and what the the staff um, reviewed in reaching their uh, their recommendation right and that uh, that is absolutely encouraged to to get a good under, thorough understanding of the application and we're here and we do that staff, all the time typically we're talking generally about renee you greg so are you always almost in every application meeting are the two of you usually in the meetings sometimes all three almost always okay because that I, you know Renee, Rita was here for 30 something years and you know had that institutional knowledge yeah. i know you're a little bit newer but have been here a number of years so yes. okay right so that yeah that is that is kind of the world of of the planning department right now is greg renee and myself right. reviewing the applications and making those recommendations so let me clarify one thing that happens to, to me quite a bit um, regarding ex parte communication. In our neighborhood, some people always, the, so you're on the ARPV, that, that comes up, and they say, well, am I allowed to do this? I'm like, look, I'm going to give you whatever the code book says, but at the same time, I'm not going to read that to you, and then it becomes, well, Rob said I could do it. So my recommendation is always, you know what, start with Renee, send her a note, and, and ask and then you can work through the the staff like that is that an appropriate way to start with you to, to do something yeah like because that? i'll always ask trey <laughs> well that's, I, i'd rather you like you filter stuff like that yeah. and then decide how okay that yeah that is absolutely correct and, and i would definitely not tell anyone that that they can do right. something I, 100%, and, yeah. and it, even if they can do it it still needs to be approved under our zoning code right so can I, Rob, can I paint my house? Well, of course, yeah, I'm, I'm on the ARPB, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you, can't, but what color is it? That can't, that can be reviewed, or that, that is reviewed under our code, but it is a level one. So you guys don't see paint color as part of just a paint color. You do when you're looking at a whole application, because then it's not just a level one, it's a level two or a level three. I'm repainting my house, but also I'm adding on, you know, 600 square foot addition. Okay, well, that all is now going to be reviewed by you. Right. But if it's yeah, but yeah, absolutely. And Renee is the person that you want to want to send everyone to because she's the one that we now have a, a fillable form application uh, that she can circulate, give them exactly what's needed for whatever the application is that uh, or whatever the improvement is that they're going through. All right. Uh, and then oh, so again, uh, moving on to quasi judicial proceedings. <clears throat> again, you are applying the facts, which is the application to the law. Quasi-judicial difference for, differs from legislative because you are applying the policy, which is the town code, rather than formulating policy, which would be changing the town code. So it's a little different with, with the mayor and the commission where they have the, uh, the power under our code to, to uh, you know, enact an ordinance that changes, like we're looking at artificial grass and, and, and allowing that maybe under certain circumstances. That's legislative. There's no ex parte, there's no prohibition on ex parte communication because they're a legislator, they're talking to the public, they're changing law. What is the general feeling and consensus of that? Uh, whereas quasi judicial, you, someone may be trying to move the needle in one direction or the other, and you want to make sure that you disclose that. <clears throat> so that's the big difference there. 99.9% .9 of the time, the stuff that you're looking at is going to be quasi judicial because that's your role. You, you review 
these level two and three applications for development that are, it's a set application that you apply the set criteria to. There are instances in the past where the town commission has said, hey, ARPB, can you give us an opinion on this legislative matter? Now, that would be something that's different. It hasn't happened in a while, but I don't know if that's something that with artificial grass, we're trying to figure out how to wrap our hands around that. That might be something that they, they send down to you for an opinion or study, and that would be legislative, and you'd be acting in an advisory capacity as you know, assisting that legislative decision. But again, 99.9% .9 you're looking at uh, at quasi-judicial. So again, you follow specific criteria. Typically, that's going to be Chapter 70, which is the design manual. Chapter 71 covers multifamily, uh, and we do occasionally have some some architectural changes to multifamily. But really, it's just it's your single-family applications, uh, new homes, and, and remodels. You have specific design guidelines, massing, architectural style, uh, neighborhood districts. Personal opinions are not relevant. If, if you don't like a project for for a, a, an amorphous reason, you need to figure out what that is and if it relates to something in the town code that you can. Uh, you can justify a, a denial. I don't like it well because this this certain thing. Oh, and look in the code, it says in fact no, they can't do that. So that's that's something that you would need to uh, put on the record uh, for discussion. And then I just want to mention that we do have our staff report, which uh, provides a lot of information on the project. Uh, you know, some of you have seen thousands of them. Some of you have only seen a few, but it gives you the address, the approvals that were they're requested. And then some of your highlights, the, the, the permitted floor area ratio, the proposed, the eave heights, the building heights, things that are really the hot button issues uh, historically, um, just really for, for a number of years. That's all that's carried over from when Bill Thrasher uh, and, and Rita were here. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it references various sections of the town code that uh, Greg has reviewed in making his recommendation. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, now we're kind of just talking about jurisdiction of the ARPB. Level one, as I mentioned to Mr. Canfield, you guys never see. It can be any of the things listed here, a minor accessory structure, unless it's detached and habitable. An expansion of an existing primary accessory structure of up to 10%, but less than 300 square feet. So if it's something that's small, we just had uh, someone at the, uh, the Casitas said they wanted to enclose, move some things around. It was less than 300 square feet. I said, Renee, yep, that's a level one. We'll do it. You guys don't have to worry about it. Changes in exterior wall roofing, window, door, mailboxes, on air column material, which are not significantly different in color, texture, or appearance in the existing materials. Makes sense. It's not a significant change. It shouldn't get architectural review. So that kind of stuff is just what we deal with administratively, but we do apply the code uh, in, in making those, uh, those decisions. And probably our favorite is removal of up to two trees over eight inches in caliper, provided that reasonable replacement trees are proposed. I can't tell you how many times residents get upset that they can't just pull out a bunch of trees. But this is Gulfstream. You have an approved architectural plan. You can't just make huge changes without review from our board. Okay. And then level two, I've got uh, got Mr. Dunham in there with <laughs> with the flags, like he's some sort of. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just want to thank him for uh, for posing for me. Uh, so level two is is you are the final arbiter as uh, the ARPB. So it's a detached habitable minor accessory structure, expansion greater than 300 square feet but less than 50 percent. Same uh, same as a demolition. Uh, you have some authority regarding removal of trees without replacement of trees, new entrance gates along A1A, and all projects within the North Ocean Boulevard Overlay District, that is the 50 feet east and west of A1A. So if anything we're going to see as we're driving along, that gets approval by you. Uh, and then uh, changes in exterior wall roofing, window door mailboxes, awning, which are significantly different in color, texture, or appearance. So if there's going to be a significant change, that's something that goes to the ARPB. And then uh, to, to kind of pull in the illustration of Greg, development approvals, which otherwise would require a level one, but he says, no, and we're sending it to a, to a level two. Now, I, we can't approve this on a staff level. And that is something that we do occasionally when the development's potential impact warrants, it, right? So you have the, the final say on those. And then finally, our level three, that's typically your, your new house. 
or a very it'd have to be a very significant remodel uh, where you serve as uh, a recommending body to the town commission. So against new primary structures and a number of other things listed there, anything that includes a special exception, even if it's something that's minor, they're expanding just you know a few hundred square feet, but it's not it's less than 50%, that does pop into uh, a level three. Same thing with variances. Uh, any any variance from the code uh, is gonna pop into a, a level three where you're gonna make a recommendation to the town commission. Uh, but again, typically that's that's the the new, the new builds. So just now we're we're going to transition to the Gulfstream Design Manual. So this was originally created in 1995 and received the National Award of Merit by, uh, for our um, our contract planners, and it covers extensive regulations, uh, which is why it's so beautiful in town because we are uh, you know we're we're pretty strict in style and size. <clears throat> and it covers everything from setbacks and maximum floor area to architectural style and design. So starting with the, the low hanging fruit, which is so easy for staff to apply, we have our, our setbacks there uh, on, in, a, in a chart from the code. You can see that, for example, on A1A, because the lots are larger in Ocean West and Beachfront, there is a larger setback. So it just, it relates to uh, to the, the neighborhood district, and we have those different zoning districts. So as you can see from the chart, there are different criteria. Typically, they're very similar uh, with, with slight differences, but it, it acknowledges the difference between the, the core, the Ocean West District, the Beachfront District, North South District, and Place of Soleil. Uh, floor area ratio is consistent throughout, uh, throughout all the districts. It is 0.33 of your first 20,000 square feet, which is, which is very large, it's 6,600 square feet. And then after your 6,600, you take 20% uh, of everything over that. So it gives you uh, that, that full uh, third for everything up to 20,000, and then it gets uh, smaller proportionally the larger you get. Um, so that, that allows, um, <clears throat> It recognizes that the relationship to the scale of an existing neighborhood is an important community character concern. So uh, that is is where we are now and have been for a long time with uh, floor area ratio. There's been discussions from various board members of adjusting that, uh, and that's that's really uh, to be seen. But those are some easy figures. When did that that floor area ratio go into effect? Do you know roughly? Uh, I mean, has that been like? 20 years or? Oh yeah, 20 years or more. It's been for, for a long time. Uh, there are there have been changes to the code that impact um, massing, second story, second story. portions, right. uh, where they we now have like a wedding cake type yeah. setup. Uh, so you're not just seeing a blank two-story wall, uh, but but the, the FAR has, yeah. has rem remained largely untouched. And those are those are things that are very easy when we sit with an applicant to say, here's here's your allowable FAR, don't go over this. Here are your setbacks, minor accessory structures, pool equipment, you know, pool house, primary structure. It's fairly easy to apply. So then we have, of course, our architectural style. So if you if you drive up A1A from Delray, you'll pass Gulfstream and you'll say, oh look at everything's so nice. And then you get into Ocean Ridge and Malapan, and everything is still very nice, but the architectural style is very different, and it, does, it may not be as cohesive as you see in Gulfstream because we have specifically prohibited a number of architectural styles: A-frame, Art Deco, Contemporary, Geodesic Dome, Cracker, Modern Glass Cubes, Monterey, Nondescript, which is not having an architectural style, and all traditional styles that are uncharacteristic characteristic to South Florida. So that is something that sets us apart as being very different. Um, there are no order. We want to know what cracker style is. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Might have to take that out of there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Cracker. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I believe that's a, an older Florida style. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's an, it's an old, right? um, <laughs> I won't reference some other codes that I've seen elsewhere that are, are very outdated. So, okay, yeah. all right. Uh, and then of course we have our preferred, uh, I've, I've bolded Gulfstream Bermuda and Spanish Mediterranean. Those are 
typically the, the most popular or prevalent around town and have additional standards contained in the code for those specific architectural styles. And then there are also Anglo-Caribbean bridge and some other preferred styles. <clears throat> so uh, again, if- Can I ask you a question? Yes. Can you go back to the preferred styles? So like, and when somebody says, okay, let's say it's a, a colonial West Indies, and I go to my book and I have all my things of what's prohibited, preferred under those, you know, for the windows and all that. Yes. And the Bermuda is listed, but let's say it's Colonial West Indies. I don't find those in there. So do I just kind of follow the Bermuda? That, right, that, right, that's absolutely right. So um, you're skipping ahead. Sorry. But, <laughs> but, but, but I, I'm addressing this. Yeah. I'm, okay. I, I, I know this is an issue, so I'm addressing it. And I've, I have spent a lot of time looking at my code book and I've run into the same problem as well because it's different when you have a Spanish Mediterranean, I, I, I'm sure. Uh, so your Spanish Mediterranean, there are additional standards within 216 through 222. So if you're looking at roof, <clears throat> windows or entrances, you have to comply with our general architectural standards, but for Spanish Mediterranean, you also have to comply with that section of the code, right? Same thing with Gulfstream Bermuda. The, the, the shutters section in Gulfstream Bermuda at 7240 does not apply to other architectural styles, but we do have general architectural styles that does cover shutters. 7102. So that is what you need to be aware of when you're looking at an application that's not Spanish to Mediterranean or Gulfstream Bermuda. You're looking at 798 through 107. Oh. All right. So, right. But when you're looking, but those apply everywhere universally but there are additional standards for your Gulfstream Bermuda and your Spanish Mediterranean. Right. And that, that, trip, that trips up all the time. our applicants oh, sure. all the time. But, but we have had applications that have come in under one style, which is not approved, and they get sent back, and then the architect just renames it, you know, Gulfstream Bermuda and reapplies using the exact same thing and uh because you know there is there is a little bit of leeway there and uh i remember i remember at least one situation like that. sure we we've had a i'm trying to think if, if this fits your criteria but staff are aware of that potential issue years ago we had uh, the Red Book, which was a survey of all of the architectural styles. Really, it was a catalog of all the homes in, uh, in Gulfstream. We are looking at potentially redoing something like that with pictures of existing homes with their approved and referenced architectural style. So we can have a clear idea of an application as a Gulfstream Bermuda, whether it is realistically a Gulfstream Bermuda based on the criteria that we see and other Gulfstream Bermuda homes in town. Okay. Good idea. Yeah, it's a very good idea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it, that was very, I mean, that, that really predates uh, me by quite a while. Um, so it, so it is outdated and just needs, needs to be updated. Because and, Rita and used it a lot. Uh -huh. to say, go get the red book. Right. You know, mm -hmm. so we have the red book, but it's very, I mean, it's all these very um, uh, Polaroids that are faded. Oh, you know, right, so we right. really need to go through and redo it again. Yeah, yes, a lot of those okay. are dark on. Yeah. So but we would they, like they, to do that. That's a project that we want. That's to on the like to do yeah. project yeah. list. Okay. <laughs> but, and the, they did a very good job with saying, this is the architectural style. Yeah. Even if it wasn't approved under our code, that's what it is. And it meets this criteria based on like a sliding scale of, yes, the shutters meet, or no, they don't, like for whatever the style is, the roof. How consistent is the roof with the architectural style that we're saying it is? I mean, it is extremely comprehensive. So again, we're just looking at doing something comparable to that uh, in the future for, for those reasons. That's not to say that st we can't do that at the staff level. When we get an application, we can pull, and which, is, which we have done, the la last few applications for that architectural style to compare it and make sure that they're being honest in their description, right? Because our, it, that's a, a big um, part of our code is the architectural style and whether or not 
uh, it has to comply with these additional standards or just the general standards. I also know, I don't think a lot of people know what the difference between colonial West Indies and Anglo-Caribbean or British, I mean, there's like two or three and it's all like, sometimes I go, well, is, they, they just fill out that application and guess what it is almost, you know what I'm saying? Okay. But the architect should know. Mm -hmm. they, hope. they should. <laughs> Well, yeah. well yeah. Uh, yeah, it depends on their agenda. That's true. Thanks. Well, we have the case for that one woman made it up on the fly. Well, yeah, she, she made up that word. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Created her own architectural yeah. style. <laughs> right. <laughs> so again, we have our 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 area wide study. You know, I remember that meeting as well. It was it was quite a quite a quite a meeting. The, the minutes are worth a reading, Terry. Uh, yeah, yeah, it didn't seem real. So, so the the intent of the general architectural standards kind of brings home what we're we're driving at for these regulations, talking about a positive ambiance, historical integrity, um, existing and proposed improvements must respect and relate to their surroundings. We have a general theme representative of the town that's largely outlined in the code. I mean, very comprehensively, not just in um, those sections with general architectural standards, but also with the, the district descriptions as well uh, that promote a community that will have a clear identity and sense of place. So these are all in the code and provide you with some idea of the purpose behind these comprehensive uh, architectural uh, criteria. So Trey, is it safe to say that, I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but it doesn't say that, like when we talk about the shutters, that metal, or not the shutters, windows, metal windows are prohibited in whatever it is, Gulfstream, Bermuda, or actually in one of them it is, but not in maybe the- The, the general, yeah. right. right. Mm -hmm. So, I personally think it lends an entire modern contemporary feel to all these houses. So I always want to deny those applications. So can I fall back on the fact that it doesn't, in my opinion, so the, maintain the character of the town? It's too modern. Does that right? That okay? So so the mo modern architectural style is is not one that's um, that's permitted, and you want to be consistent with your architectural style throughout all of the different criteria. So as an example that I've used just so many times is the glass rear railing uh, in place house to lay that we approved right. in Mr. Dorsheimer's house. Um, beautiful house, but we had that glass railing at the back mm -hmm. and there was a feeling that that was too modern. Mm -hmm. And that is something that should have been pulled out right during that process and that would have been completely acceptable because it's inconsistent with the architectural style mm -hmm. right yeah and same thing with that you 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 know it has to relate to the architectural style that they're uh, they've chosen and which is articulated in their application and provided guidance through the the code so yeah even if it's not prohibited or discouraged if it needs yeah, to be consistent yeah, with the architectural style that that's being you don't know window frames or whatever it's i just brought up metal mm -hmm. you know a lot of people are putting in these metal windows now and they're dark and i just think they kind of the anodized them. aluminum yeah and about? i just think it blends an air of right like a contemporary feel sure and, and it could be anything but i just if you know they're not because i don't think they really people didn't do it when they wrote this right. book so right. Every time it comes up, I'm always I, I Debbie Downer, and I'm like, are, oh, no, no, you know. Right. But and not, almost every time you brought it up, it's denied. You know, yeah. they'll usually say, yeah. we'll change it. We'll change it. Yeah. So right. I think they're just trying to push it. And right. then you bring it up, and they automatically say, oh, OK, we'll change it. Right. But I guess just across the board with anything that's contemporary that's trying to be slid in, because it's not in here, because I don't think they did it back then. If it's you know, if it's not consistent with our town. I remember one of the architects said, this is a modern interpretation right. of yeah. whatever the architectural mm -hmm. style was. And we told them we We're want, like, oh. we do not want a modern interpretation. Don't say that up there. That's yeah. interpretation of yeah. that architectural style. We want that architectural style. Right. So, all right. Okay. So 
so I have a, a note here at the bottom that design guides are reviewed by town staff, but are far more comprehensive than just your FAR or setbacks. Uh, and a recommendation is provided to the board by the staff without the benefit of a comprehensive presentation of the final application. So we have a pre-application meeting, we meet with them, we tell them, okay, this is what you need to change, this is what you need to modify, it looks great, but we're, we're just sitting there with a plan looking at typically for the, we have had some conversations, but largely for the first time, and we're looking at everything. We have to look at everything in the entire code. And when you're looking at a plan, a glass railing doesn't necessarily come out because it's not, it's not a full color. Mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at a plan, we're looking at uh, you know, a site plan survey, uh, renderings doesn't always come out early on in the meeting because your, your, your design professionals are not gonna give you, when they're not sure what the final design is, a complete 100% finished rendering. So we counsel them, we steer them in the right direction, and then we do get those final plans. And we review them again to make a recommendation. But again, there are things that we miss and we do not have the benefit of someone getting up on the screen, everyone sort of uh, workshopping it and looking at it <clears throat> and asking questions that, you know, two heads are better than one when we have five heads versus you know the three for staff so uh, staff is is doing their best but we definitely appreciate the uh the close attention to detail that our, our arpv provides for some of these applications is, yes sir is it is it possible to require a full color i mean given the technology out there today a full color rendering of what's being proposed at every elevation is that an unreasonable request because that because if i mean I'm, I'm not an architect by training so re reading drawings I, I would agree with you there's a lot you you your eye is not going to potentially catch but is is that is that too onerous on the applicant to re to stick something like that into the finally at a minimum the final presentation sure renee what are the required materials for uh, level three does that include it does include a rendering a rendering uh, we, we rendering don't require that elevation i think mike was asking right yeah North yeah Southeast. not not just the usually you front, see a front or a rear but uh, yeah no, it's not. right particularly when you're talking about things like also roof lines and like that in terms of being able to visually i don't i mean obviously uh, i think it's a good request yeah, and we don't always get the full color no. what we don't always get the full color like mike's talking about yeah yeah no and, and we don't require that for a pre-application right yeah and then the next time we see it after our pre-app is when they're going to submit it to come to you guys right so and ladies mm -hmm. um but it's that's and that's where we don't catch a lot of the stuff you know like yesterday mm -hmm. they you know, i was going through to get ready for your packet for next week and some of the numbers were wrong on the data table. Mm -hmm. So they were giving themselves more square footage than they really had because they had done the numbers wrong. So those are a lot of the little things we try and catch, mm -hmm. um, but we don't see the full rendering until you guys see it or the full presentation until you guys see it. Hmm. Maybe there's a difference between a level two and a level three, but on a level three, I think uh, four elevations would be very appropriate. To put on your request, um, and I don't think that the technology that's okay. These things cost a lot of money. These are these people are paying a lot of money. We should make the architects do it because I think the elevations uh, from the rear are as important as from the front yeah. people and to the sides. You got neighbors, you know. I mean, in color. I, yes. I. We all know it's the technology's there. Yes. Um, and um, sure. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be easy to add to a, to the application. Mm -hmm. So I alluded to it before, we have uh, five zoning districts in town that have different, cri or different criteria uh, on, on some levels, and they all are uh, have been acknowledged as unique and having their own sort of identity. So starting uh, from west to east, we have Place of Soleil. <clears throat> it's located on, it's our community on the other side of the Intercoastal. Then we have the Gulf Stream Core District, which is, which is essentially uh, back over here uh, with our coves. We have uh, Ocean West, which is uh, largely uh, located west of A1A uh, up north here, and then really largely most of what is 
south of the, the Gulfstream Golf Club. Uh, we have the north-south district, which is up uh, along County Road, and then Driftwood Landing and the original uh, Hidden Harbor uh, community, and then, of course, the, uh, the beachfront. So for the core, uh, the, uh, just, I'll go into just brief descriptions, and then I've got the actual extremely comprehensive district descriptions on, on the following slides. So the Gulf Stream uh, core, the homes, landscape features, and narrow streets lend an elegant yet understated village feel to the district. So that is part of the district description. Uh, Ocean West. Houses are set back great distances from the road. Again, they, those are some larger lots. Uh, the homes and landscape features lend a formal, elegant, and estate-like feel to lots in that district. Uh, the beachfront, the homes and landscape features lend a formal and private estate-like feel to the lots in the district. North-South, materials and design elements are employed carefully to provide a consistent residential and human scale to all of the houses. And then Place au Soleil uh, includes several modern features not found in the other districts, such as wider streets, cul-de-sacs, landscape boulevards, and a gatehouse. So uh, again, I'm just, this is the district description for the Gulf Stream Core. As you can see, it is very long and comprehensive. This is part of the award-winning design manual uh, that acknowledges that all the districts are unique and have their own sort of individual identity. Gulfstream Core District is characterized by one story and a few partial two-story houses which fit comfortably on the lots. <clears throat> Talks about the window types, landscaping, and the original um, formation of, uh, of, of the district, originally consisting of polo fields and associated bridal paths. So Ocean West, again, we're looking at the area just west of A1A, north of the club between A1A and the core, uh, a lot of the larger lots there, and a number of lots south of uh, the, the big club. These are one story and a few partial two-story houses that are set back great distances from the road. Nearly all the houses in the Ocean West District are the Gulfstream Bermuda style or closely resemble it. Accordingly, predominant exterior materials include white cement tile roofs and pastel stucco walls. So again, very comprehensive, well done study for all of our dis districts. <laughs> Must have hit the wrong button. <laughs> the point in sort of laboring over these district descriptions is, is to acknowledge that they are unique and is something that you could should consider in your review of, of each uh, application. And that's something that the staff is going to also uh, make sure the applicant understands that this is the district that you're in designing this home. Um, it, again, some beachfront, the north, south. This has got to be my, my favorite uh, description. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's characterized by an eclectic yet pleasing mixture <laughs> of one and That'd two story. Spanish Mediterranean, Gulfstream Bermuda, contemporary and ranch style homes. So there are some homes, uh, architectural styles that are uh, prohibited, but uh, we're moving toward, uh, you know, as, as the homes are, uh, are sold over time, uh, you know, new, you know, new homes built that uh, meet the code, but all also are eclectic yet pleasing, right? <laughs> uh, and then of course, uh, Place au Soleil. Uh, here is uh, a, a recent uh, picture from the property appraiser. We have our, our new Blue Water Cove lots there on the north. We're adding a, a number of homes uh, there that should that are, uh, I think some of them are under construction. We've approved three. We're going to see a few more. <clears throat> uh, it's characterized by one story and a few partial two-story houses which fit comfortably on medium-sized lots. Together they lend an informal, harmonious neighborhood feel to the district. 
They also have an open front yards provision. So largely you will see, um, as opposed to, to the core where you have much more narrow roads and large landscape um, hedging material, when you drive around uh, Place Au Soleil, and there are very large, uh, the, the, the streets for one are, are much wider. And then you have just really a lot of, of green space. It's just very, very beautiful. Um, and, and a different and unique uh, district. Uh, so the purpose of districting was to ensure that the quality and character of the town is preserved. Uh, districting will enhance the application of standards on a more specific level, allowing more creativity while still maintaining the overall integrity of the neighborhood. And then it finally says it will reduce the need for variances. And now we're gonna jump into special exceptions versus variances. So those are two completely different things. They have nothing to do with them, one another. Special exception is something that is specifically permitted under the code if you meet the criteria. So some of the criteria might be, if you have a beachfront home, then you can build a certain area. You can build a gatehouse. Or if your lot is, a, is so small that your FAR is impacted, you can still get a house of at least 2,500 square feet. Those are specific criteria that would only apply to you if you meet the other factors contained in a special exception. And then, of course, a variance is something that is not prohibited at all in the, in the code. You want to do something that is inconsistent and specifically prohibited, and you have to meet those, uh, those variance criteria. So some examples of special exceptions that I kind of alluded to, uh, we have special exception floor area ratio. Uh, the first one is lots of less than 7,576 mm -hmm. square feet. You might think that is the weirdest number. How do they come up <laughs> with 7,576? And the reason why is if you multiply that by 0.33, it comes out to 2,500, <laughs> right? So anything less than that, you still get 2,500 square feet on your home if you meet the criteria relative to looking at the height of the structure relative to the neighboring structure. So it's a really small lot. You don't wanna build a huge castle if you have smaller homes next to you. The location, it, uh, it talks about uh, windows, doors, porches, balconies, and outdoor lighting. Again, talking about impacting the neighbors, location of patios and walkways, and location size and types of hedges, walls, and fences for privacy. So you have to meet those criteria to get something greater than what you would uh, just using your, your FAR. And then this has got to be the absolute favorite of all time. This is our like best special exception. <laughs> everyone used to use it. Now everyone hates it. It's kind of misunderstood. Rita loved it, but it's our roof projections, 300 extra square feet. So you can get up to 300 square feet of open unenclosed area if you meet these criteria. It shall be compatible and complementary to the architecture of the structure and add appropriate architectural detail and relief to a facade. Okay, so it needs to meet that criteria. It needs to make it look better. B, this is, this is, this is great. The roof projection shall not make the structure look more massive. It cannot make it look bigger. So that's, that's great, because if it makes it look too big, no, you can't have it. It needs to, needs to look smaller. The to so, and it's limited to 300 square feet under C. And D, this is the big thing, for each one square foot of roof projection over the maximum permissible, two square feet of roof projection must be provided that are within the maximum permissible FAR and shall remain forever and close. So if you want to exceed it by 300 square feet, you have to give up 600 square feet of enclosed area. I know <laughs> it's ridiculous, but that's, that's what I know. So think about it. You have a porch, balcony, patio, it's covered, but it's unenclosed. That counts towards your FAR. You can exceed that FAR and with more open unenclosed area, but the rain won't hit your head of up to 300 square feet. But you can't just add this extra 300 square feet without adding a lot of additional open area that's not essentially air conditioned. So your garage still counts, your second floor, your, your um, as you're walking in the, um, the large, the foyer, if that's very large, you, you count that double. So all of that counts. But if you have this open area, if you exceed that by 300 square feet, you need to give up a lot of that air conditioned space and it needs to be open and unenclosed. And I say that Rita liked that because she thought that it added variety in outdoor spaces, right? So it does make the, the, uh, the house more interesting because now you're incorporating balconies and other areas that are 
covered and just on the exterior of the house, whether it's the front or the rear, there's just more area to, um, you know, that's not just a wall, right? Because now you have something that juts out and it's not enclosed. So it allows some variety in architectural style. That is largely disfavored right now by the town commission, but that is, those are the criteria that you have to meet. And if it does make it look more massive, then the special exception fails because you have to meet that criteria. So special exception, again, that is not something that you, you put in a box. It's everyone can do it, but you have to meet those criteria. So it seems to be a point of contention. I mean, we struggle with it a lot of the time. The commission doesn't like it. What goes into changing something like that? So it just, there's a lot of architects seem to just throw it in there as a, as a, a gimme. We have, we have counseled them about, about that. Typically they will throw it in as a gimme if their project already has a bunch of open and enclosed area, right? So you're talking about, uh, and you know, they always want to design something where you walk in, in, into the front door and the rain isn't hitting your head. You've got a little refuge area. So they count that. And then they have some sort of a, a patio that's covered next to the pool. So if they meet that, they do ask for a little bit extra, but the intent was for the, a very design. Okay. Um, how do we go about changing that? You know, I'll I'll, uh, I'll talk to the commission and, and let you know what they say. Well, right. and that is part of the reason that I think we're sitting here was some of the yeah. struggles that we've had with it. That yeah. it meets the code based on what the book says. The project may meet that. <clears throat> so I mean, it, our opinion goes out the window there. So then we approve it, but then we hear down the road that the commission doesn't want to do that, even though it's in the code book. I think that's what led to some of the confusion as to what we should be looking at. But I think that's where the massing. That's where you get to yeah. use massing as a reason to turn it down. Right. You get to use something somewhat subjective and say, yeah, you know, the numbers work, but I don't really like it. The, 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 it's, it's too massive. That's one of the specifics made. Yeah. Yeah. Into the layer. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. But, but I have a question. Just, when the deed restriction, because we have to do a deed restriction on that, that it can never be changed ever. Right. Can that be appealed those deed restrictions that's just for my personal question. no my yeah question. i mean yeah so they file it against the the property and then any any changes that they need to do we we have a deed restriction on there indicating that they would need to get change or, or approval um so that that um that kind of just runs with the property and puts someone on yeah. notice um this isn't a one for one example, but an owner of one of the 29, 29, 35, 65, one of the spec houses, an architect called and said, hey, we want to uh, build a second story on front of the garage and then have this covered area that comes from the garage to the walkway. I said, okay, let me look up the property real quick. So I look up the property. It was a spec house. So they maximized the FAR. So I told them that you can do whatever you want but anything you add, you have to take away because it's already reached its limit. <clears throat> so that would be the same thing. When we have someone that exceeds that, that FAR, they have a deed restriction that assists us in enforcing our code and making sure that they're not adding or doing something additional and puts the new owner on notice that they can't do any even minor, minor even enclosing a wall like we had in um, Las Casitas. Las Casitas. You, could, you could not uh, do that with a with a deed restriction even though you you know it's already it's already covered right Sorry. yeah i just need to know how that but it, isn't that a natural consequence of the two to one ratio then is that you've got extra bar but so you don't mind giving up the two for one and that's why they're asking for the exception am i thinking about that right so uh, i i think that a, a, it, it may be that a lot of the applications already include a lot of open air space again um your 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 patio is covered next to your pool and that is open in an unenclosed area so that already counts <clears throat> so if you have a large area planned in your architectural design you can kind of just shoehorn that in because you already have it as as part of your project but it's also to encourage the use of that to outdoor spaces um you know that are that are not uh air conditioned but when it goes to you know resale or anything like that the air conditioned space is less because you had to cut into that for open and enclosed for that that 600. okay uh, and and to address mr canfield's point 
it, it is largely massing that the commission is looking like, and I think that's why that fails, and that is a legitimate reason to to recommend denial on that. And I think that 2775 did get like 120 extra feet. So the the compromise was we're going to make it a lot smaller, we're going to change the project a lot, and they did get that approved because 300 versus 128 or whatever it was, you know, that's that's a lot less. Um, and, and I think the impact on massing was it was acceptable. To your point, Michael, the, the concept there is right. We want to encourage outdoor space, and if you want it, you have to give up twice as much air conditioning space. So it's actually a good in concept. But I don't know if the commission really objects to it. But, uh, I encourage it, mm -hmm. but it's it's the overall look. I mean, that's what we're going to get to today. Is the discretion that you can exercise? Um, you know, the Supreme Court's uh, justice who said uh, uh, it's hard to find pornography, but I know if I see it, mm -hmm. that's what we're going to be getting. Okay. Yeah, because the lot where that came up was a quite a large lot, as I I seem to remember, but it was quite a large house, right? So seven thousand there, right? It was in, in that. <clears throat> Yeah. Right, so you, you gotta. It doesn't really matter about the size of the lot. Obviously, the house is around it and everything else that goes with yeah. that. But okay. And then we have uh, just as a way of example, it's not all numeric, um, but uh, some special exceptions for for setbacks. So again, what I mentioned earlier, you want a gatehouse in the beachfront district. Typically, you have a larger setback. But under the special exception criteria, you can get it 10 feet from uh, from from the property line there, <clears throat> if it meets the criteria. So you have to be in the beachfront. It has to be an accessory and detached. It can't be more than 500 square feet. It can't exceed one story or 18 feet tall. Uh, the doors can't face A1A. It has to be parking for it has to be screened from view from a1a so all these criteria have to be met but you're allowed to do that right and that's something that's only allowed in the beachfront district and it's not a variance it is something that's specifically permitted by the code um and one of my favorites is it needs to be designed for residential habitation so often we have like a plan that has a shower and a little kitchen and a little bed you know marked in there by the architect so that is um something that again is only permitted under those circumstances uh, and then dealing with small lots again uh, if you have a, a lot of a hundred feet deep or less you have a relief from the front setback acknowledging that you're, you don't have as much room to, to work with it may be a, a wider lot but if it's only 100 feet deep we're not going to push you 30 feet out we're going to give you an extra five feet relief again if you uh, meet that criteria and uh, again, delving into massing, the code has kind of thought about that even many years ago. Uh, down at F, the first five feet of the building must be one story in height. So even though they're letting you get five feet closer, they're not letting you put the second story portion of that closer. It's gonna have that same, uh, that same setback, right? And then uh, variance. So again, that is something that is specifically prohibited unless you meet all of these eight criteria. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just go over them very briefly. There have to be special conditions and circumstances that are peculiar to this land built structure building, which are not applicable to other land structure buildings in the same zoning district. So if you're talking about the Gulf Stream Core, that's the zoning district. If you're talking about the beachfront, that's, that's the zoning district. The special conditions and circumstances do not result from the app actions of the applicant. Uh, that's one that is uh, is tough for especially a lot of new builds because you have a blank canvas. What are you going to do with it? Can you not just meet the um, the uh, the zoning criteria? What, what, why do you need a variance? You've right. got a, a completely blank canvas. Uh, granting the variance request will not confer on the applicant any special privilege that is denied by this code to other lands, buildings, or structures in the same zoning district. Uh, again, typically that you know a variance is something special that uh, would uh, could realistically apply to to other um, other properties 
literal interpretation of the provisions of this code, whatever they're seeking relief from, would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties and would work unnecessary and undue hardship. So those are the requirements. Um, it's a minimum variance. It will make possible the reasonable use of the land. It would not uh, establish or reestablish any prohibited use. It's consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the future land use map, and it will be in harmony with the general intent and purpose of the code. So that is a tough row to hoe, uh, but if you're seeking a variance, those are the criteria that you have to meet. So again, special exceptions, absolutely permitted. If you meet the criteria, variance, something that is expressly prohibited, and you would need to meet those eight criteria. So uh, as the mayor alluded to, we are looking at massing. Uh, and one of the issues that we're dealing with is FEMA continuing to increase the finished floor elevation. So where you may have uh, a finished floor at six or six and a half next door with a single story house that was built a long time ago. And now you have a new build next door that's two stories and it's built at eight or eight and a half feet. So you already have a, a a huge discrepancy just from the baseline and then you have a two-story and they're building it a lot larger uh, than they used to uh, with with eve heights that are, are maxed out on the first and second story right. so the the question is how do we as as the town address that and and this is this is not a new conversation it's my understanding that we have had this conversation every five or ten years since the design and, and is probably the reason for the design manual uh, in, in the first place, right? We're trying to control the, um, the integrity uh, of the town and the way it appears. So how to address that finished floor elevation? Would it be decreasing the maximum building heights or eave heights? Is that something that we should look into? Uh, adjusting the front setback, again, if the front setback is, is a little bit greater, then the appearance from the street is such that uh, the structure is not as large. And then, of course, uh, this is something that was reported in the, uh, I think, the Palm Beach Post recently. Uh, a different community was, was talking about older single-story homes being demolished, often replaced with new two-story homes, and how that looks and just fundamentally changes that community. Um, I don't know. I don't think it was Palm Beach Shores. Maybe... North Palm Beach, one of the, the, the barrier island communities, uh, just, just dealing with that, like I said, that fundamental change. So how will we address that, that massive? Is it, again, increasing the setbacks for two-story portions, like we saw in that special exception? It lets you get closer, but it pushes back that second-story portion, which maintains the sort of intent of the code as it relates to massing and the view from, from the street, um, do we would we tie in floor area ratio for two-story homes with established criteria, criteria that prohibits a structure looking more massive? Is that something we want to do, or enact criteria that enc encourages single-story homes? So we're really putting this out uh, for discussion uh, now, but also just food for thought. Uh, this is something that we're we're actively talking about at the town commission level. Uh, and how to address that. We have contemplated reaching out to planners to look at our code and tinker with it, but the people that are most knowledgeable about the code are really in this room right now. Um, you know, I'm here too, but um, these, are, these are the problems that we're having, and, and those are just so, some ideas. Uh, but it doesn't seem like there's any silver bullet. We, we, we looked into this cubic content ratio that the town of Palm Beach has. So I reached out to Skip Randolph and he said that uh, the zoning staff hates it and it's impossible to apply. I said, okay, well, that, that we don't want to enact something that, that Renee will hate and find impossible to apply. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we mentioned that to an architect who does a lot of work in Palm Beach, and I think he told us that he has a specific person in his office that handles that sort of calculation. In concept, it seems like it would work because it's, it's the height of the, the volume, essentially, of the structure and the, the square footage, so that, that cubic content. So the higher you go, the smaller you get, or the wider you go, the smaller you have to get. Um, 
that's kind of the the concept that we're looking at in, in controlling that because right now we're just we just seem to be getting higher and higher we did recently modify our zoning code to uh, move a lot of our discouraged items into prohibited and that included um, roof heights and eave heights for first and second story portions so that was one step that we took a number of years ago yeah, so that was years ago okay yeah <clears throat> that was when hewlett kent was was yep. uh, was still on the mm -hmm. on the arpb um but we're still looking at fema artif you know, artificially i mean it could be <clears throat> adjusted down further correct yeah but i mean and it, and it, it might have to be quite frankly yes ma'am well you're talking about these streets like here which i think is the biggest problem polo gulf stream is it impossible to say that it has to be a one-story home uh, if we, it's rebuilt, you know, so sure. it knocks it down. We've, we've thought about enacting regulations that would incentivize single-story homes, whether that would be relaxing criteria for single-story or tightening the regulations on two-story. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, but that's something that we have thought about. I, I wouldn't want to go in and, and necessarily mandate I would want to give them an opportunity, but essentially steer them in the direction that it will be, uh, it would make more sense to build a single story. I, I've, every, every time this comes up, I think about the, the spec house that was built next to Paul Lyons on Polo. It is a single story. Mm -hmm. So the investment back expectation for that property justified making it a single story. That was what they wanted to do. They wanted to get maximum value. It's a beautiful house. And why can't we tinker with our code, encourage single story, but not devalue the property? Because we have evidence that that is marketable and, uh, and valuable. Whether it's a one story or two story, uh, it's, it's going to be the same in the end. So. Well, but, but I think like conceptually, the core has its own intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. exactly. So I'm not sure you should be that scared about devaluation because the market will tell you a house stays on the market for one day. So, like so right. less than a day. Uh, so I, I, I would, I'll actually be less worried. But is that a little bit why the, the use of the dissimilarity concept also comes into play in terms of trying to kind of fudge this this idea of making sure that we 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 prohibit massing yes right that, that's the that's the catch-all in terms of, of being able to um look at the neighboring homes and just say it, it, this one is not like the others we could deny it using yeah. that criteria yeah. yes yeah <clears throat> oh, but so, on the flip side if you drove down these streets and you did see a bunch of two-story homes on these little narrow mm -hmm. streets i think it would devalue the entire neighborhood because i don't want to drive down the street and have these things looming over me I, it would change everything mm -hmm. but the new resident coming down from the northeast right. wants that two-story house they want to maximize and therein the lies the problem yeah, yeah. right they've got kids and they mm -hmm. want they want that big house they're paying a lot of money for that lot and that's where you have to come in. And either Ocean stand Ridge is right there. Or <laughs> <steer> <laughs> in Sorry. The direction. Right. I have a few comments. Yes, sir. Please. Um, my wife always makes fun of me because I can't sit and speak. But when Trey and I thought about putting together this <laughs> workshop, uh, one reason was that as we approach our centennial, uh, we recognize that uh, there's no training or guidance whatsoever to the ARPB. We talked about this before we started the meeting. And so this is a great way, I think Craig did a terrific job on the PowerPoint to elucidate what your responsibilities are, your focus on the design manual, where to look, and the, the legal ramifications of what you do. But the other reason, uh, that I want to speak to you is to, as, as Rob said, to try to get the board 
more in sync with the commission. And, and I think really the first stop is, is here, is the board. So I, I put together this short, very short summary of the design manual's emphasis on neighborhood districts. We have five neighborhoods in town. And that was the whole point of the design manual back in the mid 90s. That's why they did it. They were concerned about mansionization way back then. And they recognized that the town has these five unique neighborhoods and they define them. And the, the two that are most at risk are obviously the core and also Ocean West. Uh, we, we've had some development there that has chopped down those state looking uh, properties. And we have a lot of large, very large homes coming into the core. And, and the core really is the, is the, main, the main problem, but uh, keep an eye on Ocean West as well. You have discretion. Obviously, you need to follow the code. And we've discussed with, with Renee and Trey and Greg that staff is now going to be more certain. Before, they would always just give us um, a statement that it either met the code or didn't. Well, by the time it gets to us, it all it meets the code, but that's not the point. And so now they're going to be a little more assertive in talking to applicants and saying, yeah, this might meet the code, but I think you're going to have trouble because of mass or the house next door, uh, the two houses. So, you know, you're going to have trouble and try to steer them away. Now, if they still want to move forward with it, they're going to indicate that in the agenda back to you. It's the code, however, there are concerns about matching or concerns about this or that, so that you feel more comfortable in asserting yourselves. Um, in that regard, we talked about ex parte communications. There is no problem with you speaking to us. So if they have an issue, call me, call someone else you know on the commission, talk to them. You're wrestling with something, yeah. You know, what do you think the commission will do with this? Um, feel free to work with us so that we're kind of all on the same page because what we don't want to happen is that it comes through the ARPB and that goes to the commission and we we shoot it down. It's not fair to the applicant, it's expensive, it's not fair to the architects either. Uh, so, but more importantly, it's to our residents. We want to try to nip this all in the bud so everybody knows where they're going. And they don't get upset uh, later on. It is amorphous. Uh, we've talked about it. You know, what's a, uh, I'm not, I don't understand, British colonial Anglo Caribbean. I've never understood what those are. And I've always found that the architects, when I question them, always, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, this perfectly meets that, you know, that architectural style. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, they don't, they don't look like a big box to me. <laughs> so, don't hesitate to push the architects or the engineer, whoever is making that application to you. Uh, push them. Uh, try to get the application, you know, in, in a form that you're comfortable with. Uh, I think what we're going to do, um, I'm going to recommend to the commission that we delegate to the ARPB the obligation of coming up with ideas to address the massing in the core primarily, uh, somewhat in the ocean west. We've talked about a few things today, and that is how do we encourage single story homes without prohibiting two story? And it can be tricky because, uh, for example, 3400 Polo was one of them, big lot, wide lot. They came in with a very big two-story home. It was, a number of people were upset about it. But that uh, architect brought in aerial views and kind of 3D color views. So what you saw was a home, yeah, it's big and it is two-story, but he had, he had uh, increased the side setbacks. So what would be better, a single-story home that goes out the full width and you end up with like the home at the end of Polo here, that is a two lot single story home that just seems to stretch. Right. Right. Definitely. That's good. So 
not all two-story homes are bad, but frankly, on the interior lots primarily, it, it's a problem. How do we address it? How do you encourage single-story homes? So that's a task I would like to send down to you to study, debate, think about, and try to come up with some recommendations to us to change the code. Roof height, I think, is one. We're, we're now we're going from six to eight feet, and it may go higher. Eve height, roof height. We have 30 foot roof. You know, that gives you 32 feet now right, over the single story home right next to it that was built in 1980. Which might be 12 feet. And it, yeah, it, 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 that's a relation. Um, FAR is probably the way you have to go. Um, there's, there's no magic to the number we uh, had, had selected. And we didn't select it, we selected some time ago. You can tweak that. You could reduce the FAR. You could reduce it for two-story homes, not on single story. You could mm -hmm. increase setbacks on two-story, but not on single stories. There's things you can do to address it, but I'd, I'd like to encourage staff to work with you at your meetings to make some suggestions to us. I can't say it now, but at the next commission, I'll bring it up, and I'm sure they'll agree uh, to delegate that to you. Um, just take a look at these, at this design manual, read it again, read the intro to it, where it talks about the districts. And when you're considering these applications, just keep in mind, what's it look like? And I think, Renee, what, what was brought up before, I think we also should require architects. Just like uh, Gary did at 3400, you bring an aerial view, because similarity and dissimilarity is all, really all we have to work with right now. <clears throat> exercise discretion. And that's what it is. It's absolute discretion. I'm sorry. Maybe it's first come, first serve, but there's a two story home here, there's a two story home here. It's just not going to look right to put a two story home. One story. One middle. story. So we're denying it based on excessive similarity within 250 feet. So you have the authority to do it. Yes, it is discretionary, but until we can come up with more firm rules, it's kind of what we have to do. Okay? I get it. All right. Thanks very much. I appreciate you all coming. Uh, anything else? Got other questions? Hey, Scott, I just have one question, yeah. or, and I don't know where it fits, but you know, as we talk about what's happening with FEMA raising um, the, the ground level, right, from which you start, have we, have, and I heard you guys mention that we're thinking about artificial grass. Have we thought about what the impact is when you have these higher homes next to these lower homes? And with our torrential rains that happen in the summer and then the flooding of our streets and the challenges that we have with intercoastal rising and our, our like, like all of that stuff also creates additional mess for the town to consider. So I, I know people who have had these larger eight foot high homes right next to them and their mm -hmm. pools flood. Every like the whole backyard floods because all the water washes right down into, <laughs> into their into their yards. So I don't know how, where that gets considered, but I would just put that out that it's a concern for the our roads. Our are team. being addressed. I mean, yeah. we, we, we put a lot of time. No, I know money into that. So once that's done, I think you're going to find the roads are much better in in the core area because uh, the, the the flooding is is terrible. I was just talking to somebody yesterday when I used to live down on right way. I remember taking the kids to Gulf Stream School in a canoe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Canoe them up to the school. It's not really. Anyways, uh, as far as drainage, do we have any situations where it's actually flooding the yards of lower Long? I was told the civil engineers have to address it. They have yeah, to drain yeah, on site. You have to mm -hmm. retain to have to be retained on yeah, the site. Of, uh, they're very aware of these civil yeah, yeah. when they. But does it work? That was my. That's what <laughs> that's the question. Does it work? Well, so yeah, you no. Know, you're required to maintain a, a certain amount, but if that exceeds that amount, it's, it has to go somewhere. So I think that is the situation that Ms. Power is talking about. Now. All of our drainage plans are required to, to meet those standards and, and to retain that on site. Um, but that, that's another reason why you could raise a concern about a particular home. I mean, ideally, we would want it to drain it to the street because we're going to have brand new infrastructure in there with the roads that facilitate moving that from the road to uh, an inlet and, and, and off, off the road and out of the community. So. 
that also affects landscape plans, right? Because we had that issue where um, I, don't, I don't think they wanted that large tree to stay anyway, but they decided since the lot was being raised that it was going to uh, the uh, it its root system was going to die, and so the the contractor actually cut the tree down without telling us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd asked if there was a penalty box we could like put them in yeah. or or something, but um, it seems to me that's going to be used as an excuse to right. just wipe lots clean problem. right now because they're going to argue that the raising of the by another foot or two was going to destroy root systems so all all trees are that they don't like or they have the argument that they can clean them out do we have any leverage in that situation um in terms of they, they obviously cut it and came in and and I guess we caught them, but no. A lot of the times, we like to encourage them to relocate trees that are healthy enough to to do that. Um, any landscaping plan are is encouraged to use the existing trees and incorporate them in. If if they can't, uh, certainly because of the the FEMA rules and essentially putting two feet of dirt on top of uh, a root system. Uh, I mean, that's really beyond our control. Um, I know that they, I think, mentioned that they were going to put a retaining wall around the root system just to be able to uh, allow it to survive. Um, but that, that's something that is really um, out of our control, unfortunately. Uh, we do have um, some pretty tough regulations on the state level about what we can do with trees and what we can't. Um, and in our code, really just it's you're encouraged to incorporate existing landscaping into your plan uh, but as far as you know these older trees that I mean they're just unfortunately they may just disappear over time given what you're saying now a lot of them that may be at the front of the house may not be as impacted because you're typically not raising the, the very front driveway right it's it's a finished floor elevation of the structure you've got your setback you're able to pitch down and incorporate that into your drainage plan uh, so as far as like the um, like the canopy over Polo or or some of the some of the roads in town, that will probably largely be maintained. And, and I know that the commission has um, looked at that on some applications within the last few years and and asked that certain trees you know be maintained in that area. Um, so as but as far as like the rear or any you know, other where you know any Royal Point Santa that's in the back of the property you know there's not a lot that we can we can do under our our regulations typically those will be pulled out and they'll just put put new trees in you know they're going to meet the code but as far as existing you know there's not a lot of teeth to require them to maintain a lot it's just encouraged is there any way of uh, changing our penalties for for you know, for, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these issues arise by landscapers coming in and just cutting things and saying, "Oh, you know, I didn't realize that." And the fine is something like fifty bucks or something like that. Can we change that to five thousand or replace uh, replace the tree that you took down in its similar height? I mean, because otherwise people are going to say, well, there's no penalty, just cut it down. And I mean, you know, the situation down at the end of it, well, I, this is all being taped, right? So I don't want to, uh, but there was a situation where a guy actually wrote a check for additional monies, you know, let me know when I've run out of my uh, $50 funds, you know, so I mean, it's, it's ridiculous to, uh, to have minor fines for infractions yeah we, we have looked at that uh it's difficult to combine all the various sections of the code ordinances and zoning and design manual with penalties uh trey has been working on it for some okay. time and we'll bring it to fruition at some point um we brought in jones foster to look at it as well and unfortunately it was it's I'm not quite sure I understand why, but they reported it was so complicated that by putting in certain penalties, you, you could inadvertently penalize other activities. <clears throat> so it would require a really 
studious evaluation of the code okay. to to address those. But you're looking at yeah. it's more than just that. There, yeah. there are other things we want to penalize. We give okay. the police more authority to discourage certain behaviors. So relative to <clears throat> relative to code enforcement, your first violation is capped at two hundred fifty dollars. So that would be the maximum that we could penalize someone for a violation, even with a a, a citation. Uh, but oh, well, thanks. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you. everybody coming, and uh, the, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Hunter. This is one of the longest meetings we've had. Get everybody.